Today, you'll meet 12 singers and bands that absolutely hate their own songs. Here, you'll see music stars who, for reasons like empty lyrics, lack of personal connection, and record labels' insistence on recording questionable quality tracks, ended up disliking their own compositions. Let's watch it. It's fascinating. Oasis. In their native England, the band led by the Gallagher brothers is so much more than just Wonderwall. Songs like Live Forever and Don't Look Back in Anger also hold a special place in the hearts of their fans, solidifying them as one of the most influential bands in UK rock history. In other countries, however, the situation is different, as Wonderwall was such a colossal hit that in many places, Oasis is seen as a one-hit wonder. Over the years, the song has continued to divide opinions, even among the Gallagher brothers themselves. In 2008, Liam expressed his disdain for the song, stating that he couldn't stand it and felt like vomiting every time he heard it. This aversion likely stems from the band's peak fame, when the vocalist would travel abroad and everyone called him Mr. Wonderwall, in reference to their most famous track. On the other hand, Noel Gallagher doesn't share his brother's visceral hatred of the song, but admitted that outside of England, Oasis is primarily known for the single released in 1995, a hit that, for better or worse, defined their international career. Nirvana. Smells Like Teen Spirit isn't just a song, it's a generational symbol. Since its release in 1991, the band led by Kurt Cobain rewrote the rules of rock music. In the preceding years, the music scene was dominated by glam and polished perfection, but this song ushered in a new wave of authenticity and a heartbreaking cry of rebellion that captivated millions of fans. The electrifying and noisy opening riff became an anthem for a generation that, until then, lacked a clear voice to express their discontent. While the world adored the song, Kurt Cobain hated it. Even though Smells Like Teen Spirit propelled Nirvana to the top, the vocalist never wanted to be seen as the leader of a cultural revolution. In his view, everything had been commercialized too quickly, and the track, which initially was an ironic nod to youth conformity, transformed into a banner for the very trend it criticized. The musician even claimed that his song, Drain You, was just as valuable, if not more so, but people only wanted to hear the hit that MTV relentlessly played. This tension between artistic authenticity and uncontrollable fame began to unravel his emotional stability to the point where success became an unbearable burden. Additionally, this internal conflict marked the beginning of a tragic outcome that ultimately claimed the life of the genius behind Nirvana. Miley Cyrus. The moment Party in the USA hit the airwaves in August 2009, it was an immediate success that catapulted her career to new heights. The song not only reached the top 10 in eight different countries, but also sold 4.5 million copies, earning an impressive quadruple platinum certification. At first glance, this hit became one of the artist's most representative songs, capturing the energy of a generation that sang along to every word of the lyrics. While everyone celebrated and danced to its melody, Miley was grappling with an internal struggle she described as immeasurable hatred for the song. In a wild anecdote, she was at a nightclub in Chicago when the DJ asked her which of her songs she wanted to hear. Her response was blunt. She asked him to play Can't Be Tamed and not Party in the USA. This incident sparked rumors that the singer no longer enjoyed her biggest hit and was doing everything she could to distance herself from it. A while later, Miley clarified the situation, explaining that she recorded the song simply because she needed a track to boost her clothing line at the time. Since she didn't write the lyrics or compose the music, she never felt a personal connection to the song, unlike her more intimate compositions like Wrecking Ball and Flowers. Lady Gaga. Before taking the music scene by storm as Lady Gaga, the artist, whose real name is Stefani Germanotta, worked behind the scenes writing songs for other artists. One of her biggest hits was Telephone, which she originally wrote for Britney Spears. However, when the Princess of Pop didn't include it on her album, Gaga reclaimed it and turned it into one of the most iconic anthems of her career. Despite the success of Telephone, which reached triple platinum status, Gaga admitted she has a complicated relationship with the song. This is because the metaphor-laden lyrics about suffocation and her work addiction 
reflect her internal struggle with the pressures of the music industry. This same stress led her to emotionally distance herself from the track, feeling that the mixing and post-production process stripped away any genuine connection she had with it. The music video for Telephone, praised for its extravagance and narrative, is also not a favorite of the New York diva, as she described it as overloaded, tedious, and clumsy, despite the immense budget behind its production. Lastly, she revealed that the final version of Telephone included in the album The Fame Monster underwent significant changes from the lyrics she wrote for Britney, which is one of the reasons she considers it one of the low points of her career. ACDC In 1980, the Australian rockers faced a monumental challenge, replacing lead vocalist Bon Scott, who tragically died from alcohol poisoning. Amidst this crisis, the band found Brian Johnson, who joined the group and helped create what would become one of the most legendary rock albums, Back in Black. This album not only surpassed the sales of their previous works, but also became a cornerstone of rock music worldwide, often regarded as ACDC's best. The success was overwhelming, but it also posed a new challenge, how to continue surpassing their own achievements. Thus, in 1982, the band released For Those About to Rock, an album that, despite the anticipation, failed to meet expectations. Guitarist and founding member Malcolm Young didn't hesitate to call it a complete disaster, stating that it lacked the cohesion characteristic of ACDC, felt pieced together, and lacked the flow that a good album from the band should have. Songs like Let's Get It Up and Snowballed didn't make the impact they hoped for, but ACDC refused to be defeated. Despite this setback in the 80s, the Australians continued creating music, and their perseverance was rewarded with multiple impactful albums, including their latest release, Power Up, which reached number one in over 10 countries and demonstrated that they still have the power to electrify the rock world. Lord. A little over 10 years ago, the New Zealand artist rose to global fame with Royals, the lead single from her debut album, Pure Heroine. This track not only topped the Billboard Hot 100 for nine consecutive weeks, but also earned her two Grammy Awards, one for Song of the Year and another for Best Pop Solo Performance. For these reasons, Lord was thrilled with the recording and felt immensely grateful for the accolades. Over time, her relationship with Royals changed dramatically as she confessed that after hearing the song countless times, she began to find it horrible. While she recognized the impact and success it had, the artist admitted that when she listens to covers by other musicians with new arrangements and sounds, she realizes the original version doesn't sound as good as she thought. With a touch of humor, Lord compared her most famous song to the ringtone of a Nokia cell phone from 2006, pointing out that while no melody is bad, both sound simply disastrous to her. Despite being her own biggest critic, she remains grateful for the single that changed her life and hopes her future compositions will reach a higher artistic level than Royals. Guns N' Roses. In 1988, Sweet Child O' Mine hit the airwaves, propelling Axl Rose and Slash's band to the top after achieving their only number one on the Billboard Hot 100. The story behind this song is as accidental as it is legendary. During a rehearsal, Slash began improvising riffs and without realizing it, stumbled upon the chords that would become the foundation of the track that would forever change the band's fate. Interestingly, despite its overwhelming success, the guitarist hated the song. For him, Guns N' Roses was a pure, hard rock band, closer to the aggressive sound of ACDC. For this reason, Sweet Child O' Mine, with its up-tempo ballad style, didn't fit with his vision of what the group should represent. Still, the public quickly embraced it, and its constant rotation on the radio propelled sales of their debut album, Appetite for Destruction, to over 24 million copies sold. It's also worth noting that bassist Duff McKagan wrote in his autobiography that Slash considered Sweet Child of Mine the worst song in the band's catalog. But over time, he softened his stance for a simple reason, the considerable royalties it generated over the years. Queen. In stark contrast to other rock figures, Guitarist Brian May is one of the most sensible and reasonable musicians. But that doesn't mean he doesn't occasionally hold opinions that clash with the beliefs of his own fans. A clear example is his rejection of Don't Stop Me Now, 
the triumphant single released by Queen in 1979, which continues to resonate 45 years later in all kinds of celebrations. From the beginning, May expressed his discomfort with the song, arguing that Freddie Mercury's lyrics underestimated the dangers of HIV, a disease that was beginning to cause global panic at the time. The musician, with his characteristic reflective approach and scientific background, stated that he felt the festive and uninhibited tone of the song was not in tune with the risks that were already evident to many people. Over time, he recognized the positive impact of the song on Queen fans, admitting he is surprised to see how Don't Stop Me Now remains a favorite at weddings, bachelor parties, and even funerals. But despite his reservations, he cannot deny that the energy and joy conveyed by the song continue to make crowds smile around the world. Madonna For many artists, their early songs and albums reflect their most creative and experimental phase. However, for the material girl, her musical beginnings are far from being a source of pride for the reasons explained below. Although songs like Like a Virgin and Material Girl marked her rise to stardom in the 80s, the queen of pop feels no attachment to them. In fact, she despises them because their cheerful themes bear little to no relation to her later, more personal works. Like a Virgin was her first major hit that reached number one on the Billboard chart, but it is the song she hates the most. In fact, on her latest live album titled Madame X Music from the Theater Experience, she chose not to include it and preferred to focus on her more recent and experimental productions. Apparently, this difficult relationship with one of her most emblematic hits is nothing new, as during an interview in 2008, the singer claimed she was not sure she would ever perform Holiday or Like a Virgin live again unless she was paid $30 million. A year later, she softened her stance on Holiday, but added Material Girl to the list of songs she never wants to hear again. Led Zeppelin. According to vocalist Robert Plant, there is one song that seems to haunt him relentlessly, despite his numerous protests. The most surprising part is that it's the award-winning Stairway to Heaven. Although for millions of fans and critics, it is the band's undisputed masterpiece. The co-author of the lyrics does not share that enthusiasm and has, in fact, made his aversion to the song clear on multiple occasions. He even described it as an unbearable burden due to its omnipresence on the radio and in popular culture being covered so many times that he called it a damn wedding song. For him, the popularity of Stairway to Heaven became so overwhelming that he simply can't stand to perform it anymore. In a 1998 interview with the Los Angeles Times, Robert was blunt in stating that he would get hives if he had to sing the song at every concert. Several years later, he took his disdain even further by donating $1,000 to a radio station when the hosts claimed that if they reached their donation goal, they would never play the song again. Therefore, it is shocking that the iconic ballad became a pillar of rock adored by millions of fans, yet its only detractor is none other than its co-author and vocalist. Radiohead. There's no doubt that Creep is the most emblematic song of this band. Before its release in 1992, they were little known outside of England, but fate intervened when a college radio station in California began playing the track. Almost immediately, it became a global phenomenon that catapulted the band to international fame, but the success did not bring happiness to all the members. Composer and vocalist Tom York soon began to feel a deep discontent with the song, as he believed Radiohead should not be defined by just one track. At the same time, the lyrics addressing feelings of insecurity and rejection reminded him of a past relationship in which he didn't feel worthy of his partner. Thus, this emotional weight made Creep an uncomfortable burden for the musician. During the promotional tour for their third album called OK Computer, York's discomfort reached its peak, as occurred during a performance in Montreal when he repeatedly rejected the audience's requests to play Creep. At that moment, the vocalist exploded in anger, telling the crowd to go to hell. And the incident also captured the band's fatigue from feeling pigeonholed into a single song. R.E.M. Throughout the 1980s, this group was a pillar of alternative music and positioned itself as one of the most influential in the genre, until shiny happy people burst into dance clubs worldwide in 1991. While Losing My Religion remains their most representative track, 
Shiny Happy People was a surprise, and not in the best way. The story behind the song is, at the very least, ironic. It all started when the record label Warner Brothers asked vocalist Michael Stipe to include a lighter, less dark song in their album, Out of Time. In response, the band recorded Shiny Happy People, hoping it would be a quickly forgotten curiosity. To the group's surprise, the record label decided to release it as a single, and the result was an instant hit that climbed into the top 10 on the Billboard chart. Despite its commercial success, the singer never hid his disdain for the song, as he did in 1995, when he bluntly stated that he hated it with all his being. Several years later, he admitted that while he wasn't embarrassed by it, it also didn't bring him any pride. By 2008, he was even clearer, labeling it a pop song written for kids, and asserted that if he had to choose just one song to represent R.E.M. for eternity, he would never pick Shiny Happy People. Now tell me, which of these songs do you think doesn't deserve to be hated? Leave your opinion in the comments. Here are two options that you'll surely love.